Hello, everyone. My clock tells me that it is 3 p.m. right at this moment. So let's get started while people are still logging on. Here we are on a very sunny afternoon in Copenhagen. It's probably the hottest day of the year so far. So great to be with you in an air-conditioned room here. Very happy about that. I guess that you all tuned in because we share the same desire to try and grasp the changes that COVID-19 is bringing to our economies, bringing to our societies, and of course, bringing to people's daily life. So as we see it, the COVID-19 crisis is a catalyst or a sort of a accelerator for change. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we are right in the middle of a time where the responses of people and the responses of governments and world leaders all of the upheavals will shape the world uh, for the years to come. But obviously this is by no means an easy task because what complicates things uh, a lot when trying to understand the world after COVID-19 is that no two societies are ever fully the same and the individuals, the families, the businesses and the governments that constitute and makes up social structures vary quite a lot across regions and countries. So at least in our efforts to better understand the potential futures that might lie beyond COVID-19, we've decided to carry out this healthy study. We ran this healthy study uh, in the month of May, and we've even made it into um, a report. And today we'll present some of the most interesting findings from, uh, from our work. So thanks a lot for being with us today. A big warm welcome to, to everyone. And before we really start diving into what healthy studies are and, and some of the results, just some quick rules of, uh, of engagement here. Um, sorry to say, but all of you are muted and you won't be able to, to switch on your cameras. And that is probably for the best, you know, in terms of connection and, and noise online and whatnot. So it will only be me and my two colleagues that would be able to communicate to you. However, if you have questions during the presentation, questions around the Delphi study, questions around some of the findings, or questions around the presentation in general, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom to post those questions. And we'll revisit them towards the end of the webinar and try to answer as many of them as, as possible. At the same time, however, we would heavily urge you to also use the chat feature of Zoom, but the chat feature you shouldn't use for questions to us, but you should use for reflections on some of the findings that we present, reflect with each other and, and, and comment on each other, and we'll also try to revisit that towards the very end of the webinar. But please use the chat to engage with each other and reflect on some of the things that we present along, uh, along the day. All right, let's see. So here you have the project team and also the people that you'll be listening to today. My name is Simon and I've uh, been a senior advisor and a futurist with the Institute now for around four years. I've been working quite extensively with uh, selfie studies and other future studies methods like scenario planning and then and uh, trend analysis and whatnot. And I've been the project lead on, on this whole process here. And together with me, uh, I've had this great project team, Julia, who sits in Germany, will be checking in from there. And then I have Alicia sitting in Poland. She'll be contributing, contributing from there. So we are really trying to embrace this new ways of engaging across borders and, and, uh, and, and using webinars as, as, as a form to reach uh, out to a lot of people. So that's the project team for you right there. About SIFs, I suppose that most of you know SIFs, or else you probably wouldn't be on this webinar in the first place. But for those of you who don't know SIFs, just a few words um, about us. So we are a nonprofit independent uh, futures think tank, and we were founded back in, in, in 1969. And some quick math would, would tell you that we actually had our 50th anniversary last year, something that we were very proud of. Um, so we work globally with clients on a strategic level and trying to help them understand sort of the future and, and convey its importance to the presence. 
We work with decision makers and the mission of the Institute has always been to contribute to the betterment of society in, in broad terms and contribute to a society where critical decisions about the future are based on insights, are futures informed and not just based on intuition uh, alone. So in essence, you could say that we believe that the future belongs to no one, but yet it believes to all of us, everyone at the same time. So what is a healthy study and why do you want to do one in the first place? But if you ask me, it's actually a pretty underutilized future studies uh, method. Often you see when working with trying to, to explore the possible futures, you often see scenario building and trend analysis, but I actually think that the Delphi study is a really, really powerful tool and I'll tell you why. Because essentially what a Delphi study is, that it's all about leveraging the collective knowledge, the collective insights and perspectives from an, a panel of experts that's been carefully selected for that specific task. So the Delphi study is a collaborative future studies method designed to elicit consensus of an expert panel um, and, 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 and sort of, what can you say, ask this panel of experts for their insights around the series of propositions about the future. The method is simply based on the principle that collective forecasts from a structured group of experts provide superior insight and orientation around what can you say potential future developments especially when dealing with highly uncertain and highly complex areas which arguably a post-COVID-19 world is I, I, I would actually um, in my career as a futurist I would say that it's probably one of the most uncertain and most complex future developments that are, are connected to the post-COVID-19 world. Technically what we've been asking the experts to do is to um, give their assessments on a series of propositions related to a post-COVID-19 world. And most of the time, we've asked them to assess any given proposition along a five-point Likert scale. So you have a scale that normally goes from something like very likely all the way over towards very unlikely. So that's the sort of the response scale that experts are assessing uh, any given proposition around the future based on them. And we've used an online real-time platform to facilitate the whole thing in real time. I'm not going to go too much into the technical details on how consensus is measured in the panel, but whenever along the way that you see a group stability measure that is above 55%, then we can say that the extra group reached a consensus on that given proposition or given question. So the group stability tells you something about how strong the group consensus is on any given proposition. But obviously it's important to note also here that the group won't always reach a consensus on all of the propositions. There can be dissensus in, in a panel, obviously there can. And sometimes you might even wonder why the consensus pick, the sort of the consensus response is not necessarily the option with the most responses because the consensus pick, and stay with me here, the consensus pick is the one where the entirety of the responses sort of converge around. But it'll all make much more sense when we go through. I won't go too much into the specific details here. But the collaborative and consensus building element essentially lies in that the expert, they can monitor the overall panel, panel opinion and argument of the other experts, and they can be informed from the arguments from the other experts. Um, and along the way, we encourage them to revisit and potentially revise their own res initial responses, considering or taking into account the current panel opinion and arguments. So as we go along and have more and more iterative rounds, the consensus sort of shifts forth and back a little bit before the answers then tend to sort of converge when the experts reach some level of consensus. 
technical stuff, but I'm pretty sure it'll all make much more sense as, as, we, uh, as we go along. And if not, feel free to reach out, obviously, and we can take this bilaterally at uh, another point in time. The expert panel that we put together consisted of 28 experts within future studies and strategic foresight, academia, and even some from business. And so the common denominator uh, for this expert panel is that it is all people that are working with the future. That's the common denominator for the panel that we've put together. So we tested propositions within these four areas that you see here. We tested propositions within economy and globalization, within society and government, people and behavior, and technology enables life. In total, we had 32 propositions across the four areas, very diverse set of propositions actually, um, all the way from global supply chains towards how uh, will we wear face masks in uh, areas where we didn't uh, use, the, use it before. But obviously we won't be able to present all of them here today, unfortunately, I'm sorry about that. Um, so we've cherry picked the best ones uh, for you. The formula as we go along, for how we present the findings today is that the narratives that you'll hear, the lip service that you'll hear the three of us give to any given statement, that is informed, that's based, those narratives are based on the experts' insights and their arguments. So we want to stay true to the Delphi method. And even though I would argue that obviously we at SIFS are pretty good at working with the future and have some, some insights ourselves, we are going to stay as true as possible to the Delphi method. And in that sense, we are working to sort of stage the insights and the outcomes from the panel, not necessarily our own insights. Very good. I hope you're still with me. Uh, and before I start presenting any of the findings, I just want to reiterate this one, uh, this one thing again. Please, if there's anything that surprise you, or if you have any reflections you want to share, please use the Zoom chat function for that, and please engage with each other uh, in, in the chat forum. Good, let's get started, for real. All right, so, globalization. It's definitely been a defining feature of our modern world and the way that we live our lives today. And you could argue even that globalization as we know it has been under threat for a number of years for, for the likes of, from the likes of, let's say protectionism has been on the rise, populism has been on the rise. We've seen increased geopolitical uh, tension. We have the huge global crisis around climate change and arguably the COVID-19 pandemic presents the most recent challenge that will arguably influence this. Um, and not only in the purely global context, we also had some propositions around the future of the uh, EU and the future of the geopolitical rivalry between US and China. But nevertheless, if you look at it pragmatically, so far it seems like the global response to the crisis has been rather uncoordinated in, in many ways. And the main focus has been on national agendas. Um, and that strategic and, and what can you say, economic sovereignty have had a priority in the way that we've handled crisis response, uh, at least in, in the beginning of the crisis here. So could COVID-19 mark a decisive transition away from globalization and global collaboration as we know it? So we asked the experts panel, which of the statements is more likely to happen? Uh, is it more likely that COVID-19 will lead to expert enhanced uh, to lead to enhanced global solidarity and stronger collaboration and maybe even reinforce a world that's open or on the other hand is it more likely that we'll see an accelerated shift towards a more disintegrated global order and creating a world that's less open and here you see the experts uh, verdict on on, on this this is actually one of the questions where the panel were not really close at all to reach a consensus. And it was very interesting to see uh, along the way that consensus actually didn't really shift much. It seemed like this is truly one of the, what can you call the mega uncertainties of the time to come? What direction will globalization uh, go towards? 
So no real consensus here and really a divided expert panel on this. And it hasn't been possible to sort of elicit consensus even though um, we have had iterative rounds on, on this. Another one of the really, really tough ones uh, and, and, and high level ones out there is that I think that most of us can agree that at least the period of economic recession is, is at this time unavoidable and we're right in the middle of it. And we can probably also agree that it will reach beyond the immediate economic impact that we are feeling right now. Um, so we've had IMF and others even predict that this will probably be one of the most severe recessions that we've experienced in, uh, in our lifetime. So obviously economic recovery will depend on a variety of factors, such as, for example, when do we have an effective vaccine widely, widely available? How long uh, are we going to live under uh, lockdown restrictions? And obviously also individual countries' economical and, and political means of, of recovery. So a global recovery is difficult to talk about. It's probably going to vary a lot between regions and, and even countries. Um, but e either way, we, we asked the question to the panel, which of the following recession development trajectories they see as the most plausible or the most likely globally. So on the more positive end of the scale, we have the V-shaped, where we have a sharp but brief economic decline, followed by a strong recovery. And on the other side of the, of the spectrum, we have the, the, the negative L-shaped recovery, where we have severe recession and then economic growth doesn't really return to trend line for many, many years. So this was the question that we asked the panel to try and reach a consensus around. And again, this distribution here is actually, again, quite remarkable because we know we're near a consensus on these very high level um, developments. And it really reaffirms me that the high degree of uncertainty around economic impact and recovery from the crisis makes it extremely difficult to anticipate what would be the most plausible economic recovery trajectory. I think it's quite remarkable to see across these four different recovery scenarios, it's almost evenly distributed what, uh, what the experts believe to be the most plausible. But obviously that in itself is, is a really, really strong and important finding that the, this is one of the things where it's, it, it, it's highly uncertain and extremely difficult to reach a consensus. Supply chains. It seemed like global supply chains sort of instantly became the face of the pand pandemic, so to speak, because it instantly became evident how much companies rely on these global supply chains when they, when they come to a standstill. So the big question out there is if global supply chain setups have simply been too volatile uh, to respond to unexpected risk events such as the, as the COVID-19. And in many ways, you could argue that the shift towards more regional supply chain setups has been underway to some degree uh, for a number of years for a variety of reasons, mainly because of technological development and also because of, uh, you know, that reshoring becomes a, a business strategy to a much larger extent. So we asked the panel, uh, the experts, whether they believe that COVID-19 will be a catalyst to decisively rethink supply chains towards 2030, uh, which will lead to a significant regionalization of supply chains. And yes, finally, we have consensus in the panel. So there's a consensus that this is very li this is likely going uh, to happen. The panel clearly believes that COVID-19 will be a wake up call, wake up call, so to speak, for accelerated actions to improve resilience of supply chains due to shocks in a more regionalized way. And some of the arguments also pointed towards the fact that, especially when talking about essential goods, like for example medical supplies, this might even more so be the case that that we have setups that don't depend on, on global supply chains to the same degree, even though global supply chains might still sort of be the backbone of, of, of global trade. Talking about 
automation here for uh, for a second it's actually evident from, from from historical data that in times of crisis the pressure for companies to revamp their operations to sort of increase efficiency and productivity becomes higher so normally when there's a time of crisis you would see a spike in, in automation of, of, of business processes and this time around we could probably see the same thing um, but incentives might be just might, might be more than just beyond uh, economic crisis because machines of course if you automate processes machines won't spread viruses and they are not as susceptible to you know stand still when a pandemic breaks out so you have the crisis as a motivating factor but you also have sort of the spread of a virus as a motivating factor to sort of put more machines into the, the equation but obviously on the other hand you we've we've seen unemployment skyrocket in, in across the board actually and across industries and countries and arguably we will probably see governments uh, engage in huge efforts to, to get people back into jobs as part of, of recovery uh, strategies and to add to that argument the significant rise in unemployment um, will intuitively also make human labor relatively cheaper so are we going to see um, an accelerated labor market automation. We asked we asked uh, the panelist question, and the consensus is pretty clear that it's likely to happen. So the panel believes that labor market automation is likely going to be accelerated by the economic downturn uh, from COVID-19. So a lot of jobs is already being lost um, because of the crisis itself, and with the outlook, even more jobs lost to automation obviously follows the question of mass unemployment and, and how to politically respond to that and probably that could be a really really be a battlefield uh, for for the years to come to address politically how to how to cope with this one of the more curious questions that we we asked the panel on sort of the socio-political side of things is if GDP will continue to be the global standard for measuring a nation's progress. You have the OECD and the UNDP and, and probably others as well been working on this for, uh, for several years, uh, how to sort of expand, how to measure the success of a nation to, to incorporate a broader well-being uh, point of view besides just measuring uh, on GDP growth. And this is normally a discussion that divides people quite a lot. But COVID-19 has certainly prompted renewed calls for sort of alternative measures or at least uh, complementary measures to GDP that captures broader well-being of a nation and, and, and its people. So we asked the, the, this question to, uh, to, um, to the panel. Um, if GDP will continue to be or will no longer be regarded as a key measure of a notion of success or a nation's success. We didn't reach a consensus in the panel, even though it was very close, but you do see some sentiments uh, towards the likely slash very likely side of things here that we might be looking towards a future where GDP will no longer be the dominating or the key measure of a nation's success. So that would be exciting to see what direction that, that, that will take us. So that was the economy and globalization bit that we prepared for you. And now I'll uh, hand over the words to Alicia in Poland. Take it away, Alicia. Well, thanks, Simon. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, OK, so let's get started with the society and government. Um, so we started from a question about um, urbanization. Um, and uh, that is because cities are at the center of COVID-19 pandemic. And we can be sure that the urban life will definitely change uh, post COVID-19. And um, this could in turn impact the urbaniz urbanization trajectories towards 2013 in very different ways. And we now see that population density has suddenly become quite less attractive um, and because concentration of people um, 
basically um, causes the spread of the virus and different disease. Um, and also the developments uh, like technology enabled remote work uh, will further disincentivize um, living in cities. And the questions we asked was, um, compared to today, how will the urbanization trajectory in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis uh, develop towards uh, 2030? And surprisingly, at least to me, um, the experts reached a very strong consensus saying that the uh, urbanization trajectory will remain the same as today. And that could be because um, even with urbanization already flattening out in high income countries, it remains a very strong force around the world. And that's mainly because of the educational institutions and a lot of job opportunities being in cities. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic might even prove to have a very positive effect on sustainable and um, more resilient urban development. Um, and this actually could hopefully impact um, the climate in a positive way, uh, which takes us to the next statement. Um, towards 2030, the unintended environmental benefits of the COVID-19 lockdown will be appreciated and accelerate the adoption of a post-carbon lifestyle. So, um, you know, greenhouse gases, uh, gas emissions are down and air quality and uh, water quality have gone up. Uh, that's obviously because of lockdown. Um, which the government imposed on everyone around the world. Um, and this took our way of life to an almost complete halt. Um, and right now Europe is opening up, um, but we can be quite sure of the uh, second corona wave uh, to hit um, sooner than later, uh, which will obviously mean the comeback of lockdown. And this is actually happening already in South Korea, who admits that they are already dealing with a second wave. So this, the lockdown showed us that um, drastic lifestyle changes, they mean a lot to the environment, uh, but the society is very likely to uh, shift back to some kind of the new normal, as we like to call it, uh, when COVID-19 passes. And uh, the narrative that COVID-19 is actually good for the climate could be dangerous and misleading and even could undermine uh, the support for climate, um, climate action. Um, so the consensus reached uh, assumes that uh, accelerating of a post-carbon lifestyle is only possible. And actually in another question, um, we ask an, another question about the climate uh, and ask if the climate uh, agenda will get lost or not in the COVID-19 aftermath um, and the economic recession. Um, okay, and now let's look at the statement about international conferences, which are in a way connected to climate because we're flying less. Um, with physical international events set to remain on hold uh, for some time, again, due to the social distancing and uh, travel restrictions, we can see that the crisis uh, is driving the development of virtual alternatives much more strongly than the climate change um, has so far. And the statement argued over, the, uh, over by the experts was following the COVID-19 crisis, Global multilateral conferences like the uh, World Economic Forum will become more digital with fewer delegates flying in, uh, but rather joining by virtual platforms. So digital tools and formats may enable accomplishing the same tasks in different and even more effective ways. And actually everyone can experience it now, even us right now, and we can see that it, it's possible. Uh, but on the other hand, we can already see and hear that, the, for example, the COP conference uh, was cancelled this year, but will happen in physical world next year. So they are not going for the uh, virtual. And as you can see, opinions about this matter were very divided. Um, key multilateral summits might be still too complicated to be hosted uh, virtually. 
in the near future, especially the ones, uh, the diplomatic ones. Uh, but on the other hand, the younger, more tech savvy generations of new diplomats uh, might find it more intuitive and exciting, maybe, to experiment with virtual alternatives um, over the next decade. Another statement, uh, statement concerned the gain powers of governments, and it read as follows. Uh, many governments will be reluctant to relinquish the new powers assumed as part of crisis emergency responses, even after the COVID-19 crisis is over, uh, leading to a democratic recession. Um, so the COVID-19 is, um, is putting governing institutions to test in terms of their ability to, to function well, but also to perform responsibly and reasonably. Um, but the political consequences of this crisis are not yet well understood. Um, governments, even in the most democratic nations of the world, uh, have assumed unprecedented huge emergency uh, powers and they did it very easily. Um, these newly given powers might be retained to some degree as population uh, coming back to normal takes over. And the hope here is that democratic governments will be held accountable uh, by their citizens in this aspect. And unfortunately for us citizens, uh, the expert panel believe it will possibly uh, be the case. And some observers point towards a democratic recession that has been going on long before COVID-19, um, as more countries have lost rather than gained um, civil and political rights in, in recent years. Uh, sad to say that Poland is uh, one of the examples here, but hopefully it will change on Sunday when we have our presidential election. Um, and COVID-19 could possibly even accelerate this trend. And the uh, last statement uh, from the society and government um, area that we want to show you today relates to the future of healthcare. Um, following the COVID-19 health crisis, healthcare systems will allocate more resources to more digital healthcare solutions focused on self-monitoring and prevention. Um, the spread of COVID-19 has stretched um, operational systems in healthcare around the world to its limits. Uh, and it pushes healthcare to become radically more digital. Um, and there are several factors that drive this. Uh, basically, digital healthcare solutions will help protect healthcare workers and slow the spread of infections. And at the same time, uh, it can improve the reach and effectiveness of modern healthcare um, systems and reduce the costs. So as you can see, experts believe this is likely to happen, which is uh, a good news, I think, to some extent. Uh, innovative digital healthcare solutions, uh, solutions are even pushed by commercial tech companies, uh, which can help accelerate the adoption. And obviously, this alerts many people in terms of the data surveillance, which links to the previous question. Uh, about governments and the power they currently have and don't want to give it back. Uh, and unfortunately, people are willing to give up their information just to remain uh, safe. And that's it for me. And now uh, Julia will take over. All right. Hi, everyone from my side. Um, I hope you can all hear me. The third theme we covered in the Delphi is the people and behavior section, which I will present to you now. So um, times of crisis have the ability to change people's behavior, underlying principles and motivations to an extent greater than someone sometimes assumes. Of the many ways COVID-19 has changed people's lives, social distancing is among the toughest of many people, especially the extra words, to bear. And therefore, we asked our participants um, how likely it is that the vast majority of people will eagerly abandon social distancing practices and COVID-19 restrictions come to an end. 
Um, what is interesting here and what you can see is that experts were not able to agree on a consensus pick regarding the people's social distancing behavior in the future, but they provide various arguments supporting either or development. And as you can see, even though no consensus was reached, the vast majority said it's rather likely or very likely. Some observers even point out to the fact that long-term social distancing measures may be traumatic and unhealthy in its own sense. So however, while some social distancing habits may probably stick, most social distancing is likely a temporary state and a way to manage the spread of the virus, which if we are all honest, would not be a valid strategy against preventing future pandemics. So since certain aspects of lockdown life could change us forever, new social behaviors and habits may stick. In many ways, COVID-19 is showing us all how to live online and it has forced people to spend time together virtually for different ways and for different purposes. As mainly the younger generations are flocking to new kinds of virtual events such as artists performing live sets in virtual universes like TikTok and multiplayer online games like Frontline. And older generations are trying new kinds of socially distance gatherings like virtual yoga classes, virtual beer tastings, or sing-alongs. And not only is virtual socializing experiencing a boom during the lockdown life, but so is virtual consumption, of course, and shopping and exercising. So therefore, we asked our experts how likely it is that following the COVID-19 crisis, there will be an accelerated shift towards virtual socializing at the expense of physical socializing. And in this ex a statement, the expert could reach a rather strong consensus for the option possible and provide various arguments. As you can see here, it can happen, as Simon already explained, that the experts don't show a unified opinion concerning the development of virtual socializing, but they voted for likely, possible, and unlikely the most, even though we reached a consensus for the option of possible with a group stability of 68%. So however, despite the humans for most part craving for physical interaction, it is possible that this boom in virtual social behavior will stick to some degree. The question is, what impact will that have on humans, their behavior and the interaction as well as their well-being? Speaking about people and their behavior, it is prominent that there has been no shortage of public COVID-19 shaming on social media of improper pandemic behavior such as stockpiling toilet paper or poor social distancing practices. In the UK, for example, people could report their neighbors to the police if public restrictions were violated and even got rewarded for doing so. So according to the BBC, as infections escalated in New South Wales, while the crowds flocked to the beaches, the state's premier urged people to report lockdown breakers and more than 5,000 calls were made to the police in that week followed. So this changes the social fabric and could, in worst case, of course, lead to a decreasing level of solidarity and trust between, between different groups in a society. Therefore, with the third statement I want to present you now, we ask participants which of the following two statements are more likely to happen. So on the one hand, following the COVID-19 crisis, public shaming or blaming of those who do not adhere to the public restrictions and guidelines have decreased the level of solidarity and trust between citizens and the society. Or on the other hand, following the COVID-19 crisis, people have been brought closer together with a we're in this together mentality, which has then increased the level of solidarity and trust between citizens and the society. On this statement, luckily, the experts could reach a consensus with a very strong group stability for the option likely statement B. Even though COVID-19 does trigger fear and selfish behavior, the flourishment of community spirit, solidarity, and altruistic behavior are also strong side effects in times of crisis. So a sense of getting through this together in the long haul will likely and hopefully, will hopefully prevail. Further, people's behavior and sentiment towards their own and also society's health might be influenced by the COVID-19 crisis. As Alicia already talked about it, digital surveillance to fight COVID-19 is being deployed by governments and tech guidance around the world. 
As we all know, technology can play an important role in the efforts to fight COVID-19 health emergency. So while immediate public sentiment towards increased surveillance mechanisms in society may be relatively relaxed, it has driven a debate on how to, on the one side, safeguard privacy rights and uh, on the other, prevent surveillance overreach at the same time. Given the many corona apps that are being developed right now, we can see a very prominent example for that question. In Germany, for example, we have a corona app that tracks only people's meetings with other people via Bluetooth. It was launched last week and has already over 12 million users so far, which is more than 15% of the German population. And an important point of discussion, obviously, during the development was the security of people's health data. So we asked our experts um, how likely it is that compared to today, we will accept an increased deployment of surveillance tools in society, such as, for example, monitoring people's smartphones uh, by 2030 under the premise that it can curb future crises like pandemics. Um, yes, so what is interesting here is that again, the experts could not reach a consensus and pick one option, but they provided again various arguments for either or choices. And as you can see, the experts' opinion vary between very likely and likely on the one side, but also unlikely on the other side. So however, the landscape of surveillance has shifted dramatically in recent years. And there has been a great risk that COVID-19 will only accelerate this, which of course eventually might lead to a backlash from the public, but also only if people consciously experience that shift rather than being an unconscious observer of it. Yes, and the last question I want to present you is here. Arguably, the COVID-19 has led to a parallel pandemic of mis- and disinformation, that is spreading quickly over social media and other media outlets. And even information communicated by world leaders such as President Trump, who's in suggesting to inject this infectant in order to stay healthy, have been blatantly misleading and even been flagged or removed by the social media platforms. And considering the current development in the media, we asked our panelists to assess the likelihood of the following statement. By 2030, faced with an infodemic of fake news and disinformation related to COVID-19, people have been forced back to accept that expert knowledge matters and hence have become more critical in how they consume information, both from media and from the politicians. And on this statement, the expert could reach consensus with the group stability of 59%, on the option possible and provided various arguments. They, for example, argued that action from the ones who can really change, such as Facebook, Google, or Twitter, and as well the policymakers is needed, because this is the only way to manage misinformation. And there are already examples of Twitter deleting COVID-19 tweets from prominent people that were clearly misinformation, and President Trump is at the moment having a conflict with the platform, although it's his most important communication channel. So, however, the question that should be addressed additionally here could be if social media channels such as Twitter, Facebook and others uh, are the ones having the responsibility concerning what is published on, the, on their sites or if they simply should act as a platform and what consequences would this entail? Would this imply too much power for the Silicon Valley or can we even trust the selection done by Twitter and co? On the other hand, the experts also think that most people actually still don't uh, notice this information. So both Brexit and Trump prove that this information is wildly spread on social media. However, what seems clear in the end here is that an increased media coverage and the opportunity for each and every one of us to give voice, uh, to voice our opinion makes navigating through myths and disinformation nearly impossible. And according to the consensus reached, it is possible that people will be forced back to accept that expert knowledge really matters and hence become more critical on how they consume information. And all of that might prompt a renewed appreciation in the general public of expert knowledge, but the shifting understanding of the virus and the inconsistent messages from experts and public health authorities have also represented a major challenge. So that was it from my part. And now Simon will present the last section of our Delphi, the technology enabled life.
All right, so I'm checking back in, um, take you through our final topic area. Um, the decline in cash and concurrent rise in, in digital and, and contactless uh, card payments, it's already been charted for years actually, uh, and in some countries more than in others. For example, in Scandinavia, countries like Denmark and especially Sweden, we are slowly moving towards more and more cashless society. But just south of the border in, in, in Germany, we see a country that's very traditional in, in, in the way that cash remains king uh, in, in many ways, really. I found it kind of funny to see how central bank uh, central banks suddenly decided to quarantine potentially contaminated cash to sort of slow the spread of the virus. And even though it doesn't really seem like there's any scientific evidence that this makes sense in the first place, but we saw it happen in the US, and we've seen it happen in China and South Korea where they sort of disinfect cash. And in the very beginning of the, of the pandemic, the WHO also was suggesting that people should not use cash if possible. And many smaller businesses uh, also stopped accepting cash, at least for a while it is. But would this lead to sort of a fast track uh, or fast track the movement towards a cashless society? Because there are some pretty strong arguments against this uh, as well. Because a cashless society could probably lead or maybe lead to an over-reliance on, on tech uh, and digital infrastructure. And what about arguments such as social inclusion concerns, lack of payment infrastructure, and, and even nostalgia? The question that we asked the experts here is that um, due to the risk of spreading viruses, um, tech-enabled contactless payments will be adopted and cash will largely be, have disappeared as a means of payment worldwide in, by 2030. And the panel reached a consensus around that this is possibly uh, the, the, what, we'll, what we'll see having a fast tracked movement towards a much more cashless society. Um, some arguments or some experts even raised the argument that, that we already now see different nations uh, venturing into what we call central bank digital currencies. For example, China is, is very advanced in, in that sentence and Sweden is looking into this as well. So there are arguments that uh, that this could definitely speed up and COVID-19, the fact that it, it, it will become less appealing to use cash could speed that up uh, even more. Alicia already talked a little bit about uh, urbanization and urban life, but COVID-19 could also change urban transport beyond recognition, you would say sort of with a significant shift in mobility patterns and how to get around in urban areas. And up until now, we've already seen how micro-mobility solutions have exploded in recent years in, in many urban areas. You see electric scooters riding around town, you see different bike sharing schemes, etc. So when people were advised against using public mass transit as part of lockdown measures, and the fact that people arguably feel less comfortable riding in dense public transportation. Could this lead to uh, another accelerated wave of new mobility solutions uh, to be part of urban mobility systems? We asked the expert what they thought about this, if on-demand micro-mobility solutions will be widespread in urban transit systems, the detriment of public mass transportation. And possibly that could be the case, even with sentiment towards likely. Uh, some experts even introduced the argument that this could be a, a game changer in relation to uh, a more rapid adoption of autonomous vehicles for people transport and for transport of goods. But in the other perspective of, of arguments against this, we have obviously the regulation as, as one of the main arguments against this. Um, and infrastructure concerns and, and, and urban planning inertia, if, if, you, if you put it that way. But possibly we will see a shift towards on-demand micromobility solutions to the detriment of, of, of dense public transportation towards 2013. The whole conversation around the 
remote work has become one of the more positive narratives of uh, the pandemic. So obviously it started out as a social distancing necessity, um, but remote work seem, it seems like it's set to have a lasting impact on how and where work is done and how companies uh, do business uh, in general. <clears throat> As such, um, remote work or distributed work or whatever you want to call it, it's not really a new business trend, but it has been forced onto many businesses that would not have otherwise made this leap or made this change. And the same goes for employees. It showcased how or that employees can stay productive and maybe even become more productive and more engaged and that businesses can succeed even though employees do not necessarily come into office every day and let alone the savings in, in, in commute times and, and office costs and, and whatever. We asked the experts if, if this crisis, the COVID-19, will serve as a trigger towards a more permanent transition rather than a temporary one towards remote work and online collaboration with even more companies becoming remote first. And here is a pretty strong consensus that this will likely happen. Consequently, we've already seen that many companies have plans to offer the staff the opportunity to work from home on a more permanent basis. And we will likely see much more flexible and fluid and hybrid working patterns and, and arrangements. So it will be interesting to see really where this settles, if it's gonna be 100% remote, probably not, or if it's gonna be some sort of hybrid in between that, that very personalized and fits the purpose of the exact organization and, and the exact uh, the specific employee. For example, Twitter, and uh, I think Facebook as well actually, they came forward to say that if people desire, they will have the opportunity to work from home for the rest of their lives. So there really is something happening here and it is likely that um, towards 2030, we'll see a permanent transition towards more remote work and online coll collaboration. And sort of along the same lines as how work will be organized in the future, it's clearly evident that higher education has been significantly disrupted by COVID-19 as it caused a, what can you say, sudden shift away from classrooms and lecture halls to online alternatives. And even before COVID-19 came uh, along, the higher education sector was already undergoing digital transformation in many aspects, with more online and on-demand education alternatives emerging all around. But COVID-19 will inevitably accelerate the technological transformation of, of uh, higher education. So we asked the experts sort of the same question as with remote work, if COVID-19 will serve as a trigger towards a more permanent transition rather than a temporary one, where on-demand online education becomes the core of higher education models. And again, here, the consensus is that this will likely happen. We will likely see this happen. And overall, the current situation will have profound impacts on universities around the globe in many ways. And you've seen already that many universities have said, come forward to say that next semester, next semester, fall semester 2020, will be much more online and on-campus activities will be severely limited. The Copenhagen Business School here in Copenhagen, for example, they've, they've, uh, they've, they claim that at least half of education in the fall will take place online. And several uh, American universities has, has come forward to say that there will be no on-campus activities during the next semester. So this will force institutions to rethink their operating models, their strategies, and, and fundamentally the whole way that higher education is delivered. And this is, very, this is likely to happen according to, uh, to the panel. So we've actually come to the end in due time where we've reached, we, we've presented what we wanted to present, and now we're eager to re respond to your question. So let me open and check if we have any questions in there. There's one question from, from Damien Heary, and that is urbanization. If you think about the shape of urbanization, 
i.e. density of city center living versus move to suburbs and, and, and walkable communities. And thanks for that, Damien. One of the, one of the things that, that the experts also pointed towards is that urbanization might become much more of a sprawl, so to speak. And it's not only COVID-19, but COVID-19, for example, together with remote work, might make that much more feasible. Not to live in city centers, but that, ur that urban areas sprawl much more and make it much more livable in, in some of the suburbs and, and, and uh, yeah, sprawl areas. I hope that's the answer for you. There's another question here saying that if we will be producing a public report with these findings, um, we have made a report. Feel free to contact me if you want to continue the dialogue and, and we, can, uh, we can probably share the report with you and, and sort of continue the dialogue on that. And then Arthur Hannah is, is, uh, is asking what surprised you uh, the most from, from, from findings. And for, for my part, um, what, what surprised me was probably the two first questions that I presented around globalization going forward and around economic um, recovery to the trajectories, that's a difficult word. Um, the fact that it is so uncertain and that we'll have to realize that this is something that we'll have to navigate in, that's a great insight for futurists like us when we are working with companies. So I don't know if it was extremely surprising, but to me it was quite remarkable, um, at least. I don't know if uh, Julia and, and, uh, and Alicia have some, some, some things that surprised them the most. Well, I, as I said, uh, in the ur urbanization uh, part, I was really surprised that the experts didn't agree that the urbanization tra trajectory will maybe, uh, you know, become um, kind of like people will just leave c cities and live outside in the suburbs, but they actually said that the, the level of development of urbanization processes will remain the same. Thanks. So Patricia is, is asking a question regarding uh, post-carbon lifestyle uh, prompted by COVID-19. So as Alicia mentioned, one of the other questions that we had in the Delphi study was around if um, which of the statements were most likely to happen is it that the what can you say the the climate change debate will sort of get lost in the efforts to, to uh, recover economically or on the other hand will it show us that if we collaborate uh, and and uh, and work together uh, globally we we will be able to handle climate change as well and as part of that some of the arguments were around sort of this green restart and the green new deal uh, on how to to not just sort of rev up the engines, uh, the old economic engines again, but do it in a more green way and restructure it around that. So that is something that's actually in the report, um, but was not specifically presented here today. Then there is a question uh, from Dominique on how often we intend to conduct a similar survey. I don't necessarily have a good answer for you, uh, but that's probably something we need to consider. Right now, we have a similar survey uh, with a special focus on Africa on, on the drawing board with an African partner. That's as much as I can say on that, but it probably is a healthy exercise to uh, do this every once in a while. At least I, I really like this method by sort of picking and choosing the right expert panel asking the right experts the right questions and eliciting consensus that way is a very powerful way to work with the future. A lot of questions coming in. Um, there's a question on how companies can use the results of the survey to become better prepared, prepared for future trends. I think for starters, it's the dialogue uh, and the insights that, that's important here. It's not obviously a, a strategic document, a piece of strategy that can just be applied here and there, but it is part of, you know, future informing strategy work out in, in, in corporations. And that is what we normally help businesses do. 
So we engage in the dialogue. We 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 take all our all our knowledge to the table. We have to take our sources to the table, and we discuss specifically for individual companies how they can be better prepared for the future, informed by uh, insights like this. Just looking at the clock, it's it's it, we've spent one hour now. I'm going to do a few more questions, and then I'm going to have a look on. Um, comments to see if there's anything uh, good in there. There's a question from Adrian. Hello and thank you for the webinar. Regarding the shift in job relationship remote work, what long-term implications would you or your panel expect? Any mention of hiring abroad remotely and the ne necessary regulatory changes to accommodate that? Adrian, to be honest, the nature of the survey is not to sort of do deep dives into this. That's something that you would probably have to do afterwards. The nature of the survey is to, to elicit consensus around these propositions and then listening to the arguments from the experts and letting the experts inform each other in, 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 in agreeing on this consensus. So deep dives on this, I can't say much about based on this survey. That's something we'd have to look at more specifically. Then there's a question if, um, do we have any idea on, of how this crisis will change something towards human nature link on the vision of nature and biodiversity? That, to be honest, was a little bit outside the scope of the survey. We could have included questions on that, but based on the survey and being true to the Delphi method, that's not really anything I, I can provide you with any insights. Sorry about that, but obviously feel free to reach out and I'm always happy to take any dialogue uh, you might have. Which development do you look forward to the most and why? I'm actually liking the whole, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very engaged in working with the future of higher education in general. And I think it's time for disruption of, of, of higher education. So I'm, I'm pretty intrigued about some of the prospects within the area of higher education and how uh, education can become sort of more valuable to many people and, and, and not just about going to the right universities, getting the right certificates, but actually providing quality on demand and accessible uh, online education. That I look forward to following where, where it ends. I think actually I will leave it at that. Sorry to the ones who uh, I'm not able to answer your questions. Again, I just want to say thank you for tuning in. Feel free to reach out to me. You have my contact details at the bottom of uh, the screen. And reach out to me if, if, if you want to have a dialogue, if, if you want access to the report, and we'll sort something out. Uh, for starters, I'm, we are not going to share it with a public link, but uh, if, if you're interested, always feel free to reach out. Thanks so much for tuning in.